Hey, I'm Bill Gross. I'm the LA probate expert, and this is our Tuesday probate mastery alumni call. We do every Tuesday at 12 noon Pacific time. I'm located in Los Angeles, <clears throat> 3 p.m. Eastern time. And then we record it and uh, put it on social media. The best place to catch it is probatemastery.com. And on the top there, you'll see a link for the podcast and some great resources. They, the, the team there does a great job of clipping it and making it so you can look up things and find past episodes and such. It's also on YouTube. I, and I'm just kind of full disclosure, I'm just a fan of Chad Corbin and Probate Master. I do some coaching for them, more just to kind of learn the systems. It's kind of fun to play. But I'm a real estate broker practitioner. I'm not a coach full time. I'm full time a broker in Los Angeles, California in probate real estate. Chad was my coach three and a half years ago, helped me relaunch my career as a real estate agent producing and built a fantastic business and went through an iteration when COVID changed things. But I did what he said to do. I maybe took a few parts in particular to heart and worked on it and built my probate business. And so I've been on this call. I come on this call because I need it as a practitioner, keep my head in the game to network with other agents across the country and to work on best practices and vendors and new ideas. <clears throat> and I, I would say more than ever, I think those of us really doing the work need this. It's interesting because like everybody today, I think I'm taking a look at, the, look at the market and trying to see what I need to do to increase my business next year in a market with less sales. Overall, the market by volume is down about 30, 40% in terms of unit count, depending on where you are, though the sales prices have increased. And so I think what everybody experiences right now is an increased sense of competition or at least an energy about that. And so more and more, I think people are looking, well, how can I add more business? And on one hand, I caution you, and the other hand, I would say you're in the right place, in that the caution is we as realtors get offered shiny pennies all the time, or as real estate investors, we get offered shiny pennies, oh, just do this program, and we'll send you a bunch of leads, a bunch of interviews, a bunch of listings. I think at the end of the day, I've been in this business for 36 years, and I would say the shortcut is putting in a good work effort daily, five and a half days a week, over a long period of time. That's the shortcut. And anything else other than that probably doesn't work. <clears throat> but more than that, there are programs in niches that I think do, would work. I was listening to one yesterday I like a lot. But what they're missing, I think one of the key components, is a place for the participants to get together and congregate and push each other, encourage each other, support each other. I don't think there's any one coach who can do enough to help 50, 100 people. It requires, you know, they say it takes a village. Well, I don't know about that, but it takes a team. It takes a group of people to support each other in order to be successful in real estate, whether you're brand new getting started or whether you're an experienced agent like I was looking to add a new channel or a new piece to, of the business. And so the purpose of this call is weekly a place that you can come as you're building your business to ask questions. Did you get this right? How are you doing this <clears throat> to work on it rather than just set up for a class and take it and then struggle? It's going to take time to implement. And that's what we're here for. So if I can help anyway, it's the purpose. My goal here today is really just to answer questions. Now, also before I, I open up to questions, feel free to raise your hand or put a question in the chat box or yeah, raise your hand. Another, but I also want to offer it anybody who is successful in real estate, anybody here who's taken Chad's training and as a result of that has built a good business and would like to share that with other agents on an interview format. I did that recently with a couple. We're going to video them and promote them on our website. I think that I know for me personally, I always want to help other people. I feel like I've been blessed so much by coaches and support and colleagues, and it's important to help the person behind me. So if you feel you're that person that has a message to share of success, as they say in AA, hope and strength, we'd love to have you share it with us. So reach out to me. I'm Bill Gross, and you can reach out either on this chat or you can reach out to me personally. <clears throat> I'm Bill at the LA Probate Expert .com. My social medias are Bill Gross EXP. But reach out to me. I'd love to interview you and then share you with the community to help encourage other people along the way. So that said, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and I'll unmute you. I think, I believe you have the opportunity to unmute yourself, but I'll go ahead and unmute you. We'll start off with John. John, how are you doing? What's going on? I'm doing great. Thank you for taking our questions. One of the things I'm having a, I'm, I am just getting started in probate. And so I'm making my calls and I'm finding most people are on do not call lists. So I just text them and then I'm following up. I have their emails. I email them. I've been sending the letters. My first round of letters went out 
And I'm just wondering, how do you market yourself? Because this is my, my most exciting moment was just getting one response from one person who needed something that I helped them. <coughs> that was that gun trust. But that was it. That's my claim to fame so far. And it's just a lot of time being put in and it just doesn't seem to be yielding much at this point. So how do you market yourself in this probate niche? Well, let's break it down a little bit. And the goal here is to kind of get, you know, specific on the website. We charge for my time $500 for 30 minute call. I'm willing to coach you for free. I'm going to ask you some personal questions. If you don't want to answer, just say, I don't want to answer, you know, but obviously the, the prescription of medicine is based on the diagnosis. Does that make sense? Yes. So let's start off a little bit. So John, what market, where are you located that you do business? Southwest Florida. Okay, Southwest Florida. So is are you in a city like Fort Myers? Or are you in a well, suburban uh, area? Fort, yeah, Fort Myers, Cape Coral. Lee County okay. is basically the county that I would work with. So there's Bonita okay. Springs. Got it. So it's not a main city, but it's like a secondary city, but it's established suburban market, urban market. Got it. And you got the data from what company? All the leads. All the leads. And did you, and so what have you done so far? You said you mailed out to them? I mailed out to my first round of leads. I'm just getting 90 leads. Get up to 225. I think it's 225 per month, but I'm just getting there 91 just because my costs. And that's an, that's all I can handle at this point anyway, to try to call all of them or contact them. Okay. Uh, so, so you got 90 leads and you mailed out postcards how long ago? That's been about a week ago, I think it went out. Did you call before or wait till after the postcards hit before you made the I, I've been doing both. Okay. I'm just working my way through the list. So out of 90, how many you said, so one thing that caught my attention was you said they're going to call this. So I texted them. I think that's a problem. I'm not an attorney here, but just if they're going to call unsolicited texts are probably the same problem, if not worse than phone calls. I think people get a little more freaked out about it. I'm old enough to remember in the old days when you had a text plan and you had a certain number of texts and they, my teenage daughter, one time I got a phone, a phone <clears> bill for like 200 bucks for texts. That's not the case anymore, but some people have that idea that text costs more than phone calls. So I would say that I'd be more cautious texting than phone calling, okay. to be honest. I didn't, I didn't know that. I had heard on one of our calls once uh, that one guy in the class or, you know, the group had been texting. And so I thought, oh, okay, that's how I'll get around the do not call. <laughs> but maybe yeah. I, I, I misinterpreted that. Yeah. And then, okay, so that <clears throat> of the 90, how many have you actually talked to? Probably three. I mean, you dialed all 90. I haven't three. gotten through all 90. So I probably made 40 calls, talked to three. <laughs> One called me because they had got my postcard and that was the gun trust question I was dealing with. And then the other one told me it was Charles Barkley. He didn't <laughs> want to have anything to do with me. And so, and I think that's, I think that's it. I've had a couple of texts that said, no, thank you. As far as, you know, when I offered my services. Okay. So one of the things we want to do is always in marketing, we want to count our activity so we can measure it. What we measure, we can improve and we can get results from. If we don't measure, we can't go anywhere. So one of the things when I coach agents, I tell them, we want to measure your contacts. We don't want to measure attempts. You have to put in the attempts, but we want to measure your contacts. And then from there, your leads and from there, your appointments. So you've dialed through all 90 and only talked to three people? No, I've gotten through about 40 of the 90. So I'm okay. still working on that. So, so one thing I can tell, and how long did it take you to dial through the 40? Probably about, oh, I don't know, three to, well, maybe four or five hours. It's because I'm going through each lead. And if I can't call them, then I text them. I email them. Okay. So, okay. So let me help with that. First off, <clears throat> each activity is separate. You want to divide your day in general and certainly your prospecting time into activities. So you need a time for calling, a time for computer work, separate. Like for okay. me, my goal is I'm at my desk with my first appointment at 8 a.m. generally, Monday through Friday. So I, I'm trying to book appointments to talk to somebody from 8 till 5, and I take a break in the middle for an hour, and then some days I'll go to 6, depending on my schedule. But I don't, I try not to do administrative work unless I'm on hold or I'm waiting or, you know, sometimes people, you know, call, I'll call back in five minutes while so I'll go jump on the emails. But that work in my mind is done after five o'clock, between five and six. 
Okay. When I call, I want to be a caller. And so what I would recommend is take your list and just dial through them all one at a time and leave, put whatever notations you need to in your CRM or your paper so that you can come back and do whatever you need to do to them. Really, 90 numbers, the, kind of the, and you'll, when you spend time making phone calls, you're going to find that, let me back up, a couple key points. When you phone call, you want to talk to people who are ready and want to talk to you, correct? Yes. Meaning, if you let the phone ring eight times, that might mean that they were deeper in their bedroom closet, and they ran to pick up the phone, and now you're going to talk to them about private real estate, they're probably not going to be interested, right? Oh, well, thank you so much. I was just doing this and that, but thank you for interrupting me. You don't want that phone call. So what I tell people is, and I coach them, is hang up before the fourth ring. Okay. But dial through the list three times before you give up on it. Okay. So I'd rather you call 90 numbers and only let it ring three times, not four, and get through them all quickly, and then recall them and then recall them again. We don't leave voice messages. Now, I know that's different than what you hear because I think – People who don't make phone calls for a living will tell you leave voice messages. They'll give you all kinds of exotic rules. But what I'm going to tell you is your goal is to talk to people. That's the goal. The goal is not to leave messages because most people don't buy a service from a voicemail le message left by a stranger. True or true? That's very true. Yeah. But I've had numerous people call me back because of a missed call, and now we're talking. Mm-hmm. I've gotten contracts to list and sell houses when I would call people and not leave a message and they'd say, oh, I have a missed call from this number. Oh yeah, I'm Bill Gross, I'm a real estate agent. I was probably calling you because your property showed up as expired or your property showed up as a petition for, real, for probate. So then you could track your contacts per hour. Okay. And so what I'll tell you is I have 90 phone numbers, but oftentimes the agents I coach will say, well, most people don't answer. A random list of phone numbers about one in 10 will answer, maybe a curated list, all the leads. You know, I'll be honest, I haven't subscribed their data for since COVID. I used to. I use their other services, but I don't use their data for phone calling. They, I, I'll admit, I, I don't work for them, so I don't have to be up to date, but I, don't be, I believe they present their data as being curated for the phone numbers. So I would expect about one in four numbers would answer when you call. So it means I have 90, one in four is 36, right? I'm sorry, no, one in four would be 25% would be 20, about 20 something, 22. When you call strangers, you should talk to, as you get better about it, eight per hour minimum. And when you really get on the game, maybe up to 10 or 15, if they're cold calls. Probates are a little more warmer, like expired listing. So maybe eight's the maximum you can do. So... If you're calling 90 and a quarter, say 22 will answer, that's about three or four hours of phone calling in total. You follow me on that? Yeah, I do. And the one issue I'm having is the list of leads I get, probably nine out of every 10 personal representatives are on the do not call list. So, so, so that's a question that comes up all the time. And I think that one of two things, either you have to ignore them on the phone and text and just mail them or other social media marketing. Or you call them. And everybody has to make that decision based on their state laws and their company procedures. So are you a real estate agent or investor or both? I'm just a real estate agent. And who are you with? Uh, EXP, real estate. So, so am I. So you should talk to your state broker and find out what the policy is on the EXP. Uh, and what yeah. do they say? He said, absolutely not. Do not do not call them. There you go. So that's not an option for you to find some other way to reach the people besides calling yeah. them. Yeah. It just is what it is. Yeah. And that's what I'm finding is pretty much all of them. All I can do is if I can't, if I can't text them either, and then they have emails, which most of the emails are not very accurate or very good. So pretty much all I can do is mail to them. I think that's what it is. And then there's a list of other like family members, but, and some of them are not on the do not call list. So I've been making calls to them. Great. So family members are probably heirs or beneficiaries of the estate. Yeah. And so to me, they're the same, whether they're the petitioner or not the petitioner. My goal is to have a relationship with the family, right? Yeah. So, so again, all this boils down to you've got to call who you can. Those calls are gold to you because out of 90, you might have a certain number you're allowed to call, 9 or 10 or whatever. You want to make sure you talk to all of them. Right. And I would just keep calling them forever until I reach somebody. 
I would not leave messages. I would not text them. I don't want to burn them out because when you finally get a chance to talk to them, that's worth a lot of money. It's worth a lot of time to get to them. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it okay. is. Okay. Does that help a little bit as far as your focus? It does. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. Well, look, thanks for being the call and come back again. Let me know how you progress next week. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic. Steve, you might want to put your camera on. I could bring you in if you want, but how can I help? There you are. How can I help you? So, hey, I just had a couple of questions. So I know I was on here, I think it was two or three weeks ago about calling and I've been calling. New, obviously, probate's a new lead source for me compared to some others. And I've had a couple of things come up that I'm just curious about. Notice a lot of disconnected numbers. I imagine that's probably because that number probably was associated with the deceased at some point. And so they've probably turned it off. That's what I'm guessing. And, you know, I was about a month behind. So I had leads from U.S. probate at the end of May and end of June that I've been going through. And I've been surprised that a couple of people really were pretty quick to put it on the market. And I'm like, oh gosh, if I had called a month ago, I probably would have gotten it. Cause I was like, oh yeah, we just picked some random agent. <laughs> it's like, okay. So that was kind of motivating to me. I thought I'd share that for the group, but here's the other, the real question. I had two people that said, yes, it was sold through auction already. The house was sold through auction. And I, I got to tell you, I don't really know what that means. I haven't worked in this space. I've heard of auctions for foreclosures, but I'm not sure what an auction would be for probate. So Steve, where do you sell real estate? Salt Lake City, Utah. Are you an agent, investor, or both? Both. <clears throat> so obviously I don't know what the answer is because I haven't talked to people, but there's a couple different auction types in probate. So the filing, I can tell you in Los Angeles, some real, some attorneys like the idea of holding an auction. And so there's a company that specializes in doing what I would call a retail auction. And it's really no different than a regular listing. To me, it's a bunch of hype, but whatever, it makes the seller feel like they're getting, if you have multiple heirs and they're going to argue about the value of the property, it's a way to perhaps diffuse the, well, you know, should have gone for more or less. So I call it a retail auction. Another type is in Los Angeles County, and I think many counties in the country, there are probates filed by the county, meaning nobody comes forward. There's a distressed property, maybe tax liens, maybe, maybe you know, other abatement, or just maybe the house is run down and there's nobody around. Or also sometimes there are people who are out of the state or the country who go to the county website and say, can you just handle probate for me? And in Los Angeles County, <clears throat> the specific vendor who has all the listings referred by the county attorney, it's like a, it's like a government bidding process. It happens to be a company, Candy Wilson, which is an auction company. What they do is they have what I would call a pre, uh, a public auction held before court confirmation. So you can go and they market it and you go auction, and there's an auction there. And then that winner has to go to court and is subject to being overbid. So it could be either one of those. The county vendors seem to have a little more advantage as far as timing and the process of the paperwork. They move a little more quickly. I noticed in, California, in LA, for example, they get to have all their sales on the same day, Friday, and they, and, and which makes life more convenient for them when they have multiple sales. So I don't know if that helps at all, but I don't know the particulars. What I, the thing I would always say is our goal in conversations is to develop a relationship. And if you have somebody who's told you with auction, I would... You know, research the property, ask them questions, find out what you can, because that information, if it stumps you and then you figure it out, now you become the expert in that field. Mm -hmm. And I think too many of us as real estate agents, we get into an obstacle and we go, wow, that's an obstacle that's going to hold me up. But just know that if you get over that obstacle, even if it's a lot of work, it takes time. There's other people behind you are held up by it, but now you've gotten over that obstacle. So I don't know the particulars of your case, Steve, in Salt Lake City. I imagine it's one of those. But I would say go back and look at one if you can. And if it's too late next time, talk to the person, find more information. And then, you know, what I've learned over time is I'll research the MLS, I'll research public records, and I'll find out what the particulars of that deal are and be able to solve the problem. Okay. Okay. Yeah. They said it already sold through auction. So I'll, I'll let me look into it. And then I just had one more question. But when you say they uh, said, the uh, family the member. Person, the it was the PR. And yeah. often they think something, but it's close to what they say, but they don't really know the right answer. And as mm -hmm. you know, in this business, it's all about the particulars. So they might say, well, it's sold at auction, but it doesn't mean it's sold at auction. It means it's been pre-sold at auction, but still needs court confirmation, for example. So be careful uh, when PR say things. 
that you want to verify, trust but verify. Okay, okay, that makes sense. And then I had one other thing that came up in a call. This lady said, well, there's nothing we can do with it right now. We're in a lawsuit amongst all the family members. And she hung up, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah. So I'll tell you one thing I've done that works for me in a similar case. I, I learned this being in court that I sat in court one day and I saw a, a man whose nephew died. He, and the nephew had no, was never married and had no kids. And so he was posing a petition. And then the decedent's girlfriend claimed she was married. And she filed what's called a competing petition. So in court, they're both saying the judge, we want to be the one to administer the estate. And they had a property. It was vacant. And there was costs. There was a mortgage and taxes and insurance. And so the court agreed to create what's called a temporary administrator. The two attorneys had to agree on who that would be. They decided to co-administrate because they knew each other, trust each other. And they had to agree on a, a real estate agent to sell the property. And guess who they picked? My favorite real estate broker, me. Now, it's a little touchy because you're representing both sides, both two parties who are at war with each other. But if it serves the interest of the estate to sell the property, now they can sell the property, put the money in the bank. They can argue of the money, which is all they might care about. Sometimes mm -hmm. the warring parties, one of them is living in the property, is living there for free, and wants to live there forever. That scenario is very difficult. But that same scenario, there might be five siblings. One wants to live for free. One supports them living for free, but three don't. Three want them out. The three, if they get together, can basically vote out if they have the same if they have three-fifths interest in the property, again, this depends on state law, but in California, I've had cases where they've been able to go to the judge and force to sell the property as a temporary administrator. While they argue over who the administrator is, they can at least begin the process of selling the property, keep the money in the estate. The state opens a blocked account where the money gets put, and then they can argue over the money rather than the house, if that makes sense. So the fact that they're fighting over it, you might want to do some research and see who's the attorney. And if there's such a process in Utah, Offer to be the real estate agent for a temporary administrator. Ask if they're providing a temporary administrator, if that was one of the plans. And sometimes attorneys don't know that's a process. But, and again, out in the Utah law, in California, that would be the process I would go. Okay. 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 Look into it as a report back to us. Let us know how that works out. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so much. Okay. Let me knock out a couple of the chat box. I see some hands up. I'll get right to you. One question you have in the, from the alumni group from Ian. He said he hired a VA to handle calling leads. How do I schedule his calling? Do we just give him the list and have him call it every day until he gets a new list? Once he gets a new list, does he just add that to the list he has? I get my own leads every two weeks. I just want to know the best practices. So what I would say to anybody thinking of getting a VA is it is, in my experience, impossible to delegate lead generation unless you're doing it yourself successfully. And you're only going to want to lead, lead generate if you're able to convert leads yourself. So I wouldn't start with lead with a VA unless I'm successfully converting leads myself. And I just want to give more leads to a VA to handle for me. There are companies that specialize in VAs who do phone calling. The term they use is ISA, inside sales agent. That I might go to those, I think, up my up, my up desk, my out desk. There's a couple of them. And I saw a presentation, but one that I thought was really impressive. It was about $12 an hour. So they have their own CRMs, their own phone lines. They have trained VAs. If you're going to do it on your own, you're really starting from scratch. You're taking on a whole business. And I think what you're asking is, how do we design a business that I've never done before? And you know, I don't know where you are in your business. I'd be glad to talk to you if you're on the call. But I would say, generally speaking, I wouldn't want to recreate all that. I'd rather find somebody who's already created that and use their business for me. And then Mighty Mike suggests Mojo Dollar. Yeah, you can upload all the leads to something like Mojo or a Red X dialer, or there's all kinds of phone dollar systems that you can use as a shared CRM and put the leads in there and track them that way. Okay, let's get back to the live calls here. Joanne, always a pleasure to see you. What's going on? How can I help you? Well, believe it or not, I actually started to cold call the, the probates. No and way. And I, I know, isn't that something? And I, I downloaded about 64 of the numbers and I started just dialing for dollars. I was just dialing. And it's interesting. I have to say those numbers are very good numbers. They're not junk numbers, even the wrong, the wrong numbers, because you're going to be talking to somebody on the other side and you just never know. But as far as probates, I, I spoke to someone who was living in a different state 
and uh, he had once upon a time been living here in California. He had four properties, not one, but four. Boom. And one was vacant and three, he had siblings living in and they were at war. And I looked at the court date and then he said, well, no, that's not the right court date. It was extended until August because the judge has to make a, a, a decision to, to sell all of these four properties because that's the PR. That's what I want to do, sell the properties and pay off the siblings. So I ran into that one. And then I don't know, I talked to about out of what I downloaded, I think I talked to about 11 different people, which was pretty good because I didn't even get through my entire list of 64. I ran into one lady in El Monte. She said she lost both of her parents to COVID and she had hired an attorney and she was getting the deed placed in her name. And then I ran into this other lady who had multiple properties. And she says, don't even bother my daughter is buying the property. And, but it was like different situations. I even talked to somebody in New York city. So you just have to, so what I'm saying, you just have to keep at it and just dial the numbers, just keep dialing one after the next. So let me see if I have this correct, Joanna, you bought the data, you mm -hmm. called people and you talked to people who had properties, some of which they had to sell, some of which they didn't have to sell. Mm, exactly. Wow. Amazing. Newsflash. But you know something, even the one who told me that her daughter was, was going to buy the property because she said it was one property, she, she left some very valuable information. She says, I own multiple properties. And then she said that she there was an go. investor. So there I said, great. So that's a good phone number for me to call back and say, hey, what do you have that's available, you know, for a lease or even to sell? I so, would go before, before that, I think that you have an opportunity to audition for the job that nobody else has if you look for ways to help her through the probate process. Mm -hmm. See, we're too quick to say, oh, no property to sell in probate. Now you're a step up saying, well, I can, I can solicit her for other business. And I would say to you, before you go there, help her in probate. Okay. One reason why is just because the daughter, she thinks the daughter wants to buy the property, the daughter may not want to buy the property. The daughter may not mm -hmm. be able to buy the property when she may mm -hmm. want to buy the property when the mortgage payment was based on 3% interest rate. And she may not want to buy it now that's based on a 6% mortgage rate. 6%. Or even, if, even the mother wants to give it to her, which is fine. There might be tax implications. There be, there's a whole lot of things that can go along. She's got to pay property taxes, got to pay insurance, got to keep up the house, find a tenant for it. Everybody wants to, to buy the house until they know what's involved in buying the house. So mm -hmm. what I would say is I would not, I would not assume that that's really going to happen. In the meantime, who's the attorney? Are, are she doing it pro per or is she working with the attorney? Help her through the process. You can't give legal advice, but you can help her through the process. I would definitely focus on that. And I assure you, if you help her through the probate, you'll get more business than you ever imagined. Okay. All okay. right. So I just have to keep dialing. That's all. Just keep dialing well, and just, follow up. As long as you're in business, your goal is to create relationships. It's not looking for listings, though we're looking for right. listings or sales or, or purchases. It's really create relationships with people who can build, who we can build business with. And in this case, here's a woman that you can build a relationship with. And how do you build relationships? We put in the relationship before we get out of it. And so maybe your daughter wants it. Maybe you drive the property. Is your daughter local? Is your daughter also out of state? Maybe you drive the property and take pictures and that's a benefit to them. I don't know enough about the conversation, but I would look for ways to help pull the data, pull the public record documents to give to her. Look at the probate okay. case, give her information from that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks, Joanne. Always nice seeing you. Becky is a double dipper. I see you in the chat box. I see your hand up. So let's, let's see if I can get you on here for us. Um, Hi. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Fantastic. Good. This is my, yeah, this is my second time on being one of these calls. I hope this is an appropriate question to ask in here, but I wanted to, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm going through the program still, so I'm still kind of new to this and I've got some appointments scheduled this week to meet with an estate planning attorney and a probate attorney. And I'm, you know, it's going to be a quick meeting, but I don't know how to present value to them. Like I can tell them what I'm doing, but I would just like to sound a little bit more confident and put together when I meet with them. Okay. So, and, and Becky, you're a real estate agent or an investor? I'm a real estate agent. And where do you sell real estate? I'm in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Okay. Wow. I've never been to Indiana, so I really can't give you any particulars. <laughs> but what I would say is in all relationships, the goal is, to, you know, 
my my first coach was Zig Ziglar. He said, you have anything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. So your goal is to find out what they want, either before the phone, either before the meeting or at the meeting. Okay. So, so what might they want? And, and you, you can come prepared with that, or you can even just ask some questions. You know, I work, you know, I'm part of a national mastermind of probate-focused real estate agents that we work with attorneys like you regularly. And I'm just here to offer my service and see how I can be of assistance. Now, you don't want to go right to the, to the chase. You want to warm up. So tell me about where'd you grow up? How'd you get into being an attorney? How'd you get into probate attorney work how, or estate planning, whatever it is they do? And then you want to kind of look for the opportunity to see what their challenge is. What, what are they struggling with? It might just be that they want referrals from you, which is fine. And I think that, you know, I've taken the position that's what they're going to look for. So I do my best to interact with them. I, I call them, I interview them on videos and put it on my YouTube channel and on my social media. Maybe that's something you, you could do as well. You can invite them onto my YouTube channel. I'd be glad to interview an attorney in Indiana. I've interviewed attorneys, I think, in 15 states, and I've not met one in Indiana. So I think that you want to look and see what do they want, what do they need. Go on the website, see do they have a strong marketing presence or not? Do they have video or not? Do they have a blog or not? Look for opportunities where you can help them. Everybody wants help, right? Right. Yeah. So as far as explaining like what I'm doing, what's the best, you know, simple way to say, here's what, you know, after I get to know them a little bit and find out, you know, how I could bring value to them, how can I keep it simple and best explain what, what I'm doing in my market? So your goal is always to just talk about what's important to your prospect in all sales, in all sales. Uh, Becky, are you a buyer's agent, listing agent, or both? Both. So I'm a listing agent. Okay. There's different approaches, but when I go to a listing appointment, the only thing I talk about are those things that my seller told me are important to them. I don't spend an hour talking about my marketing program unless they tell me, hey, Bill, what's really important to me is your marketing program. And I would ask them, well, what do you mean by that? What are you looking for in a marketing program? How would you know a great one from an average one? And then I'll talk about that. Gotcha. Okay. And so I think the sales process, it's a little more than I can just answer and, and, but I would guide you to learn the, the art of selling. Mike Ferry is one of my teachers on that process. Grant Cardone's another one. But the goal would be to go to the appointment and ask questions. Mike Ferry says, selling isn't telling. Selling is asking questions. The more they talk, the smarter they think you are. Okay, I, I get what you're saying now. That makes sense. Thank you. Let me you. ask you another question. Yeah. It was personal, pass on it, but okay. are married or single? Married. Okay. Did you date at some point in time before you got married? A very short time. I married him. <laughs> okay. So. Did you date, but do you date other men besides your husband or was he like your, the first guy you went out with? Nope. He was my, my first and only. <laughs> okay. So, so this won't work for you, but you might notice in some of your girlfriends who date guys, the common complaint is all they do is what? Talk about Talk. themselves. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the dating tip, and I, I coach marriage minded men on how to date. It's get her to talk. The more she talks, the more she's going to like you. And it sounds counterintuitive, but that's how sales works. Got it. Okay. Does that help a little Thank bit? You. Yes, it does. Thank you so much, Bill. Come back. Let's know how it works. Okay, we'll do. Okay, good. Let's see. Who is next? Jeff Campbell. I see your hand up there. Let's get you unmuted and get you in the call. How can we help you? Thank you. Appreciate it. So I'm an investor. I've been using all the leads for about three years. I've done several probate deals. Still struggle with my intro. You know, we we got a script and it seems like it's a little long and I get a lot of, <laughs> I mean, it seems like the intro is like a minute, you know, or two. And I, I didn't know how I could bring value to them where they see value without having such a lengthy intro. You know, I know it's important to tell them who I am, what I want and how I can be of service, you know, but it's just kind of trying to make my intro better to get to get more deals and seeing what you had in mind or maybe how you do it. Sure. So what script are you using? I'm not sure. It was from all the leads. I went through the program, the probate mastery, probably four years ago. So when Chad was teaching it. Correct. Yeah. So I think I'm I've done a lot of coaching on on cold calling. That's an area I really feel like is an expertise of mine. I'm not as good in probate as I am on cold calling. 
And I think your sense of it is correct. It's got to be, a, you've got to get them. The way I think about it is you want to get them talking as quickly as possible. Sure. Because and when, anytime you're talking, they're ready to hang up. Once they're absolutely. talking, they can't hang up the phone, right? So I think your sense of it is right. And, and no offense, you speak less fast than I do. So <laughs> now, I mean, that's common where you're at. I, my sense is it is. But still, a minute's a long time to listen to anybody talk about anything. Oh, absolutely. It's way too long. And I know, and I realize that. So that's why I was here hoping to get some help and a recommendation. So I would, I would write an intro and cut down as many words and syllables as you can. You know, I, so, for example, I, I'll give you one example. I used to work for an independent real estate company in Long Beach, California, nationwide real estate executive something. It was NREE. -E. I forget what the third one was. Nationwide real estate executives. Nationwide real estate. And I just cut down to nationwide <laughs> because it saved me real estate executives, right? Like, I mean, just trim it down. Imagine you're like building the, if you've ever seen these movies about the building airplanes for speed or cars for speed and shaving down the car or the plane to, to be re resistant. You want to shave down your, your introductory sentence to as little as possible to get them to talk as quick as possible. And the sooner they're talking, the faster you are, or more likely you are to, to win. I get so, it. And I would rewrite it and rewrite it and practice and rewrite it. Now, the other thing I would say is that the number one, and I used to uh, work for a company where they charged, you know, a thousand dollars a month for me to coach them and people had to sign a contract for a year to, to, to coach with me. Now, it's part of a system that I learned and, and, and brought to students, but I also worked that system. And what I can tell you is the number one thing you can do to improve your phone calling technique, and it's brutal, and you're going to hate me when you do it, it's record yourself. Sure. I don't have a problem with that. I'm, I mean, some of these technologies like Mojo and Red X have it built in, subject to state law, whatever that means to you. We all have phones now, they can record. But when you listen to yourself, and, and if you hear yourself going on and on, you're going to realize. But my guess is you also talk too much also during the conversation, and the goal is to get them to talk. No, absolutely. I, I agree. I, I believe the 80 20 rule, you know, I, try to be an active listener and let them do the talking. I do a lot of mirroring to let them open up and I sit and listen. I think I'm pretty good at that, but you can always be better. So. All we can do is be better. Every phone call you're going to listen to, you have to ask, what can I do better next time in order to improve? I mean, that's the game we're in, right? Correct. And I just tell anybody who's in the phone call right now, you know, I, I, it's, I have my own separate, weekly podcast call I do called Probate Weekly. It's on Thursdays at 4 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern. You can register. It's free. Probate Weekly. I come out and sell any coaching. I don't sell any data or anything. I just did that before this call was launched because I needed it as well. And I do use it for lead generation and for building my team. But what I want to say is one week I had a cancellation. Attorney canceled last minute. And so I shared what I thought was the most important material I've ever shared as a probate coach which was the import, it was phone calling, phone skills. And it was interesting how I had more negative feedback on that call than any call I've ever done and more positive feedback. I had people who were actually full-time in the business text me, email me, comment in social media, wow, thanks for reviewing that, thanks for a refresher on that, thanks for your insight on calling, how important it is. And I had a bunch of brand new people and never going to be people. To me, Why are you teaching me about phone calling skills? I just want to learn about how to sell probate real estate. And it's like... <laughs> If you don't get that this business is about communication and it's going to take some hard work, the question is where do you we're going to channel that hard work and how are you going to do it? Then you're not going to be in business long. And I can just tell you today, I would say with all confidence, you either better figure out what you've got to do every day to get better and put a good solid effort in every day. <clears throat> I'm not saying work 12 hours or 14 hours a day, but a good solid effort every day and get better and improve, or you're just not going to be in this business. It's just as simple as that. We're all going to get shaken up. Can I ask you one last thing? So sure. what do you think the most important thing about the intro is? You know, I know you said, hey, shorten it way up, get them talking as soon as possible. Yeah. But, you know, the way the way the script I learned is, hey, this is Jeff. I'm calling. I'm a probate specialist here in Arkansas. I noticed you're the personal representative of state. I was calling, you know, and then I go into 
Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> the going into part's the problem. So far, so good. Yeah. So after that, then it's basically like, you know, we go to the courthouse every month, pull the records, and then reach out to the families and see what you need. We can buy houses for for cash. We buy them as is. We also can help you fix them up if you want to go that way or if you we're not a good fit. I can help you with a realtor. And then they ask, you know, the question is, what are you having? What's the biggest challenge for probate with you so far? Kind of an open-ended question to try to get them talking. But I still feel that I need to work on the intro a lot more and and smooth it up and shorten it up. The, the way you have a problem with, I think, and again, my personality is different than Chad's. I think that for me, I, when people talk about problems, they lower their energy, they get frustrated. It's like, what are you most frustrated with? And I think that, that it's harder to move people when they're down than when they're up. Well, that's why in sales, we want to be energetic and enthusiastic. And I'm just trying to see how I can be of assistance. And I think that when so mm. I find, now that fits me, <laughs> right? Because I'm calling, you know, what, you call me to help me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, if you want to call me and help me, I got a pile of stuff to help with. I got a to-do list to help with. I got honeydew stuff to help with. I got pl endless things you can help me with. You want to ask me to talk about my problems, to be honest, I don't want to talk about my problems. Now I, it's the middle of my work day, I, I'm busy. But you want to call and help me, wow, I never thought, I mean, for free, I could, you could help me, you have information to help, you have knowledge to help, you have resources, you have a roster of people that will save me trouble researching. So, so that's been always my, I don't want to say difference with Chad, but again, it has to be appropriate and it has to be, you have to own that persona. Sure. That's my persona. I'm energetic, I'm enthusiastic when I call, and I'm offering to help them. And I, I believe in my heart of hearts, and this is authentic, there is nobody who can help them more on that phone call in that moment than I can. Whether we need legal help, financial help, physical help with the property, there is nobody who's going to help them more than I am. And if they don't want it, it's their, it's their bad. Absolutely. So you get a lot of people who say, hey, I've got it handled, you know, and you know they don't. Right. Do you do third-party stories? Something like, hey, my last one I was able to help. I heard the exact same thing. Or what, so, how do you recover from there? So, Jeff, you married? No, I'm not. Okay. Have you ever been married? I have one time. Ever have a relationship with a woman, maybe your sister or mother? Of ever course. notice that they're mad at you and you say to them, hey, honey, what's bothering you? And they say, oh, no, I'm fine. You ever get that one? Oh, yes. Does that mean I'm fine or does that mean I'm plotting your eternal destruction? Right. So people, you know, the goal is to get them to open up. And I think that's just an objection. When somebody says, oh, we have it all handled, that's by definition an objection. That's so, how I'm looking at the car lot. Could be, yeah. yeah. Look, I mean, uh, I literally go to buy, and I don't have it for a while, but the last time I went to, say, Nordstrom's to buy a dress shirt, I know my size. I only wear white button-down Oxford shirts. I'm walking to the place where those are to pick up the shirts walk out the door. When they say, you know, can I help you? I could say, hey, do you know where we have the whatever it is, 17 and a half by 37 white Oxford button down long sleeve shirts? And you get them from me. But I say, no, I'm fine. I'm just looking. That's just getting them off my back. So all objections, there's a standard approach to all objections, what I call the three steps. One is repeat what they say. The biggest complaint people have with salespeople is we don't listen. And so they say I have a handled anything you say at that point there's oh my God, that just this Jeff guy, what an idiot. I just told him I have it handled because they didn't hear it. You don't let them know you hear it. So you, if you say you have it handled, great. Second step two is affirm whatever they say. Whatever they say is right for them. It doesn't mean you have to agree with it. It means you have to acknowledge that's how they think. And then you come back with an alternative objection handler. So whatever it is you want to talk about. And it doesn't really matter. You can change the subject. And if you handle that, Deftly, the way I describe that is, I, I'm like a ninja. I want somebody to give me a cell. I, I'm on this call, and you guys are just asking me questions, really objecting. The subtext is, well, this isn't working for me because this. I'm going to take it on and show you how good I'm at. I'm a ninja. And so when a prospect says to me, we have a handle, you have a handle. That's great. So tell me, what are your plans with the property? Mm. Now, if I handle it well, I hear them, I acknowledge them, make them feel good. I'm enthusiastic, I'm energetic, 
I'm not disagreeing with them. I'm not telling them they're wrong. I'm telling them they're right. Oh, great. You have a handle. That sounds great. So I'm curious, what are you doing the property 123 Main Street? Right there, Absolutely. I sell it. I just, help. Right. Okay. I get it. You just affirm and then go on with it. Ask the question. Of, yeah. Okay. Three steps. Perfect. Repeat. Absolutely. Step two, affirm. Step three is your objection handler, which is a question designed to keep it going. And it better be quick because they're trying to hang up. And so you want to keep the process engaged. Okay. That's phenomenal. Thanks for all the help. Sure, Jeff. My pleasure. Appreciate that. Sure. Thanks. Let's get, try it this week and come back and let us know how it works, okay? Absolutely. Thanks again. Thanks. Dave Gwynn. Always nice to see you, man. Thanks for being on the call. I see your hand up there. How can we help you? Hey, Bill. Great to be here. Thank you again. Always great stuff when, when you're leading the show here. So appreciate it. Thank you. I know you're not an, attorney, an accountant, but I no. did have a quick question that you may or may not know the answer to. And that's, is there any difference in how the taxable event occurs versus when you have an probate and the will is clear and there's it's going to the daughter or whatever and there are no other siblings is there any more tax benefit for her to actually take it into her name and getting the step up in basis and then reselling or versus doing it through the estate does the estate still have the cost basis of the original cost basis therefore having a bigger tax bill. And I was just wondering, comparing those two types of scenarios, is there, do you know if there's any benefit one versus the other? So your question is, should she take it to avoid the tax on the estate? Cause the decedent still has taxes to file. I, you know, I'm not an accountant. And I would say that's a great question to ask an accountant. And I need to get the answer to that question. I believe that it's stepped up because you, at least in California, we do a date of death appraisal for the purposes of establishing the value of the property. So I'm guessing that's what that does because in essence, the estate passes, not the property either way. So I don't, but great question. I don't know the answer to, I don't pretend that I do, but next time I talk to an accountant, I'm going to ask the question for sure. Okay, cool. And I challenge cool. anybody on the call. If you're an accountant, answer the question for us. If you're not, we should all, everybody on this call, if you want to make a great, business development phone call, call accountants in your area until you at least get one and ask that question. Tell them you're part of a national probate group. And the question came up and nobody knew the answer and ask if they would answer for you. And you might even ask several accountants. What a nice reason to call the accountants in your marketplace or your clients who are accountants or your personal client. What a great question to ask, right? There you go. I'm going to call. Perfect. Okay. Report back. Let me know. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm making, in fact, I'm making a note right now. Just, I'm thinking to myself, well, I could call like three different accounts. I mean, that's just an excuse to make prospecting calls. Can a step up or not when selling probate? And I, you know what? Feel free, send me this call. Feel free to ask me next week if I remember to report back my answers. Okay? Perfect. Perfect. And I had one other quick question. It came up, came to mind previous caller or whatever had asked about you know, working through lists and when you consider a number on your list exhausted, or do you keep hitting it? So until you hear something. Cold numbers, I would call through the list three times, letting it ring not four times. I would go through that list three times before I would exhaust it. So if I was doing circle prospecting in a neighborhood, I would call through that list, crossing out the disconnects crossing out the bad numbers, whatever those are. And the end of that third call, I would put the date that I finish and I would recycle that data 90 days later. That data is good again 90 days later to cold call. Probate's different because until you reach somebody, it's a, already a kind of like expired listings. It's already somewhat curated. They're getting a lot of phone calls up front. And at some point the phone calls start to drop off. And anytime you get them on the phone is a good time to get them on the phone. So I would always call the newest ones first and then go back to the older ones. And I would keep calling them forever until I reach them because I can tell you in California, Dave, you're in California. No, you're in Colorado, right? Colorado. Yep. In California, in LA County, the average time of selling a property is like two years. So I would keep calling them until I knew the number is no good. Yes. There's a lot at the end. They're going to be older numbers. 
maybe at some point you decide to drop them off. But, you know, okay. get 50 bad numbers and try that for an hour and let me know. Try that two or three times. Let me know how that works. Okay? Perfect. Okay, we've got Thanks, a bunch bro. of... Thank you. I'm kind of falling behind here. I've got a bunch in the chat box. I'm going to take... Andy is my last call live, then I'll go through the chat box to try and knock some of those out. Andy, welcome to our call. How can I help you? Let me unmute you real quick. Hey, Bill. How are you? I'm great. Kind of piggybacking on that last call, I was, I'm getting back into the probate thing after being out for geez, maybe about a year and a half. And I've decided to go through the historical leads that I have. Beautiful. Do you have a different tact that you would take when calling a historical lead as opposed to a new lead? No, I mean, it's no different than calling old expireds, I would just say, I know she'd filed a probate a year and a half ago. My records show the property is still available or the probate is still open. I'm going to see how I can be of assistance. Okay. So pretty much the same tact, but maybe mention. Yeah. hundred percent. Right. I would definitely mention if you know it's older, the data comes with a file date. So you know that it's older. I would right. definitely call it forever. Maybe, and maybe you cycle through them three times and set them aside again and come back every 90 days to get through them more quickly. But I would definitely do that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm going to try to get through it. I have, we have a bunch in the chat box that I want to kind of answer. Let's see. Elizabeth asked a great question. What if you're starting out, don't have revenue to spend on a dollar system or hire an assistance? You know, Elizabeth, I don't know about you. I got 10 fingers. They all can hit the button on the phone. There's no real, you can load them in a spreadsheet and click on them using, I use Google voice or Skype out or whatever your phone system has. Or if you had to just use a phone in your fingers, I would dial it. But we reinvest money. I would not spend money before you have it. I would spend money you don't have. I would not let that hold you up in your business. So if you don't have money to invest or to reinvest, then you need to get started. And you're investing your time to get started. Feel free to reach out if that doesn't answer your question clearly for you. Chris says that the heirs can sell their individual interests if they don't want to wait for the litigation. Yes, heirs can always sell their, their if they want to wait for litigation or just for the probate in general. Don mentioned Upwork as a Upworks.com. I use Upwork for a lot of VA work. But again, they don't come trained, in my experience, to having to hire them. There are companies that have trained ISAs that are, have systems in place to support them. I did not find Upwork. I've used Upwork before they were Upwork, and I have currently seven VAs with them going on different projects, but I don't believe they have, you know, odds are you're not going to find somebody who's going to get done what you need. Belinda says she had an ISA do calls for the list. And she didn't get much, but you do have call reluctance. Yeah, Belinda, the problem is if you have call reluctance, you're not going to solve that problem with an ISA because it, they're going to set appointments or leads for you and you need to be good on the phone to convert them. That's even the higher payoff business. So definitely if you have call reluctance, that's going to be a challenge. Brian says, if there's one thing I could take off your plate to help you, what would it be? That's a great question. Again, I think that we want to come from, I want to come from being positive. I want them to be engaged in a positive way. Okay, Elizabeth says, I'm in the same position. I'm glad you guys are helping each other out here. Role play is important. So I would say role play can be important. I've done a lot of role play in my career. I would say don't role play and then hang up the phone and not make your phone calls. Sometimes I know a lot of agents have hidden behind role play and consider that work. I would rather you role play with customers and make the phone calls than role play with a partner and then not make the calls. Brian says, too much explaining before you start talking. I would agree. And then he gets some sample scripts. Very nice. I think they look great. And like somebody's going to schedule fine. Okay, thank you, Bill. We're going to take some probate scripts. I would say probate ma Elizabeth Probate Mastery would have scripts there for you. Victoria says she's new to the program. Realtor, mostly listing. Where did she get data? So a number of people here today, we talked about alltheleads.com as a source of data. On my website, thelaprobateexpert.com, I actually have a page with all the various data. So I'm not sure where you're calling from, Victoria Torres. Maybe I should remember. I know I recognize your name. But hold on a second. On my website, I have a page with all the data sources that I've discovered. And I'll put it in the chat box right now. And if you, know, you can try them, some cities and areas have, some I don't have others. So all the leads is national, probates. Daily is national, probates, data is national. So try one that works for you. Or if you want to reach out to me, you know, reach out. I'd be glad to talk to you individually. Okay, so scripts. Wow, I got 21 call, 21 things I didn't get to here. I got apologize. I'll let time kind of run out on me here. Oh, man, I got to it all. Okay, good. Last question. Myrna, hand up. You've been patient. Sorry about that. I'm running fast here myself. How can I get, how can I help you? Myrna, I've asked you to unmute, but you're in your hands up, but I don't see you muting. No. 
last call, Marina. Okay, I so am we're gonna... here. Sorry. Oh, no problem. How can I help you? I have a quick question. I've been door knocking around my house, and I, through neighbors, I heard that two families, well, two owners passed away. I checked with the title company. They both have trust, so that means they're not going through through probate. Probably. Uh, what's the best way to reach out to families like that? You know, I can't say I've ever discovered a magic formula other than trying to find somebody who knows them and reach out to them, mail to the house, mail to the address on the tax records. That's what I did. Yeah. I, I've done that and I can't say I have any special talent in that area. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, sure. So I can't help more, but yeah, I think that's a magic question. Everybody wants to know, where do I get, where do I get the trust lead phone number of the person who really controls the trust? And the answer is they built the trust so that you can't find them. So it's challenging. And, but you know, once you're door, one of the powers of door knocking is to ask about the neighbors. Sometimes you ask them and say, I've been trying to reach so-and-so. The neighbors will love the house to be sold because it will sell for a high price. It will bring typically more tax revenue and a, a new neighbor in a house that otherwise is abandoned. And so you might ask them if they know where the, who's in charge, where the kids are, who are running that. And that might be, that's been the only thing I've ever done that worked for me. Okay. Sure. So I'll ask to have a training on Thursday. Yes, I do. ProbateWeekly.com is Thursdays, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. ProbateWeekly.com. I also have a Facebook group, Probate Experts in Facebook. That said, I also am regularly on the Probate Mastery alumni chat board in Facebook. Go there with questions. And that's why we have this call is to, is to share together. So feel free to reach out to me there and I'll catch up with you. I somehow got through all the chat. I'm sorry I kind of ran behind there, but you guys are really engaging today. Thank you for participating. And again, the purpose of this call is where it's the teamwork makes the dream work. We all at some point in our careers, whether you're new or established like me, start out with dreams of a lot of income and wealth and freedom. And, and along the way we discovered, or will discover that number one, it's more work than we thought it was. And number two, that we can't do it on our own. We need help. And Chad's an amazing coach. And I've been working with him for three and a half years. Yet we need more than that. He can only be in one place at a time. And that's what this call is designed for us to work together and support each other and work on best practices. Today, the question was one that I should know the answer to. I'm embarrassed that I don't, but I'll promise you I'll know it by next week. And I think anybody on the call today who's serious about their probate business should also find out how is the property value handled in a step up or not in a probate versus the sell the property in probate versus the, the taking the property and reselling it. It's a great question. I remember who asked the question, but I'm embarrassed that I didn't even know that. But I'm going to find out. And that's what this is for. We should all work to every day improve, to be better, to be, create more value for our customers, more value for our referral partners, attorneys, or whoever. And then but, and do that by helping each other. So I'm here to help you. This is the Probate Mastery Call. We do it every Tuesday, 12 noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, and all the other times. It's posted on the website, probatemastery.com, under the podcast. And there's highlights on the YouTube channel. Reach out if I can help you. I'm Bill Gross. Thanks so much for everybody who participated. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks.